Distributed on the air and on the internet since 1993, serving the amateur radio community with weekly reliable amateur radio news and special features, you have found This Week in Amateur Radio. We are the worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1278 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Tropical Storm Hillary hits the southwestern U.S. Amateur radio operators are activated for emergency communications. Meanwhile, amateur radio operators activate to respond to disasters and severe weather all across the U.S. this week. The FCC grants permission for low-power emergency AM broadcast stations to be set up across Maui to aid in communications. Candidates are named for the ARRL director and vice director elections. We will introduce you to them. The upcoming Air Force and Marine Corps marathons are in need of amateur radio volunteers for race communications. The FCC announces plans to place U.S. Cyber Trust marks on consumer electronic devices moving forward. Authorities in the U.S. warn SpaceX and other tech companies that they may be a target for foreign espionage. A group from Italy has won the Hackasat. That's a satellite hacking contest, and we will have all the details for you. The FCC is planning a nationwide test of the emergency alert system and the wireless alert system this coming October. A much-loved surplus electronics store in Ohio has decided to close its doors. And we will have a special story out of Huntsville, Alabama, and the Huntsville Ham Fest where a parachute mobile ham sets a QSO record and unites the ham radio community there. And India has become the fourth nation on the planet to successfully land on the moon. There is a special event station on the air to commemorate the landing, and we will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit, and Bruce is actually with us this week. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, reminisces about radio when he was a kid and discusses what he calls the new I generation. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio, looks at how he believes that hams should gather data rather than opinions. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to November 2nd, 1920, and the role radio station 2XB, which later became KDKA, played in what many call the beginnings of the broadcast industry in the United States, and the role amateurs played, because at the time, it was legal for hams to broadcast. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will discuss what you should do when you perform your pre-winter tower and antenna inspections. And we will stop by and visit with Bill Sawyers, HA8B, in the DX Corner with all the latest news on DX expeditions, DX upcoming contests, and a lot more. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Sitting in this week for Danny Haight, NZ8D, and Eric Zytel, KD2RGX, and reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from my home studio that's full of all these transmitters and antennas and things. Well, maybe it's my ham shack then, not my studio. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from my amateur radio studio here in Middle Tennessee, I am Marvin Turner, W0MET. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, where the air is getting chilly, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the garden is overflowing with pumpkins and sunflowers, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And now, with this week's lead story, here's our own Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our news this week, 
Amateur radio operators activated on Sunday, August 20th, 2023 to provide communications and information for Tropical Storm Hillary. As of mid-morning Sunday, the system was moving up the Baja Peninsula of Mexico, expected to cross into Southern California. Heavy rains were falling in San Diego, and local media reported that 250 airline flights had been canceled. Amateur radio operators began Sunday morning. The WX4NHC amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center was on the air. The National Hurricane Center, or NHC, also utilized the VOIP hurricane net, IRLP node 9219, and Echolink WX-Talk conference node 7203. The NHC also monitored Windlink reports via WX4NHC at windlink.org, wrote WX4NHC amateur radio assistant coordinator Julio Ripoll, W4R. The Hurricane WatchNet was also activated Sunday morning and remained active until services were no longer required. The system does have a good chance of crossing into California as a tropical storm. If so, it will be the first tropical storm to hit California since 1939, wrote net manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV. HWN seeks reports to relay to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. They have operators who are fluent in English and Spanish to take reports. Such weather information we look for is maximum sustained winds, wind gusts, wind direction, barometric pressure, rainfall amount, how much over X amount of time, storm surge, and damage. Should you have any outgoing health or welfare traffic before, during, or after this event, we are happy to assist as we work closely with the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, wrote Graves. HWN also exists to provide backup communications to official agencies such as emergency operations centers, Red Cross officials, and storm shelters in the affected areas and relays damage reports. The primary frequencies the net uses center on 14.325 MHz and 7.268 MHz, depending on propagation. HWN thanks radio amateurs for yielding those frequencies during operation. It certainly makes our job easier, and I know those in the affected areas appreciate it as well, said Graves. ARRL will continue to monitor the situation, and headquarters staff members are in contact with WX4NHC, the Hurricane Watch Net, and VOIP Hurricane Net officials. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The fires are out on the Hawaiian island of Maui, but extensive search and rescue operations continue. President Biden visited the island on Monday, August 21st, 2023, and told residents the federal government will provide help for as long as it takes to recover from the devastation. Numerous emergency response agencies and organizations are still arriving, and volunteers are helping to provide coordinated communications on the KH6COM repeater on 146.520 MHz VHF slash UHF countywide system with emergency backup power. Hawaii has many amateur radio repeaters and an extensive internet-linked repeater system. Meanwhile, on the west coast of the United States, after a record amount of rainfall, Hurricane Hillary was downgraded to a tropical storm and is heading towards the northeast. The West Coast area is still experiencing flooding and mudslides as residents face major cleanup operations. Section manager of the ARRL Los Angeles section, Diana Feinberg, AI6DF, said there weren't any amateur radio activations, but the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service and ARIES groups were on heightened alert. There was minimal damage in the Los Angeles Basin area. Feinberg also said the City of Los Angeles Auxiliary Communications Service was activated and reported to the Emergency Operations Center, but there weren't any communications outages. Section manager of the ARRL Santa Barbara section, John Kitchens, NS6X, said there was more concern for the 5.1 magnitude earthquake that hit his area during the storms. There were no actual activations, but we were ready. Our local amateurs took advantage of the situation and turned it into a real-time drill, said Kitchens. 
As we reported earlier, the Hurricane WatchNet, WX4NHC, amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center, and the VoIP Hurricane Net were activated on Sunday, August 20th for Hurricane Hillary. Despite having bilingual operators in each group and the storm's impact to the Baja California Peninsula, there weren't any reports from Mexico, much to the concern of net operators. WX4NHC Amateur Radio Assistant Coordinator Julio Rapol, WD4R, said hurricanes have no borders and ham radio has no borders. Rapol encouraged Mexican stations to check in and pass along reports when the net was active. We can work together to help each other and those affected by hurricanes, he said. Tropical storm alerts were issued along the South Texas coast on Tuesday, August 22nd, as Tropical Depression 9 formed in the Gulf of Mexico. The storm center moved inland over South Texas by midday when it became Tropical Storm Harold. It caused rain and wind, but there was little to no damage. The South Texas Amateur Radio Club said their amateur radio operators were ready, even though they were not activated. While tropical storms and an earthquake impacted large portions of the country, much of the Pacific Northwest has been dealing with wildfires. In eastern Washington, the Spokane County Aries ACS was activated to deploy a mobile network unit to the Gray Fire on Friday, August 18th. The mobile network unit is a self-contained satellite-based internet and cell support from AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile systems. Volunteers set up the gear at an incident command post used by county officials. Radio amateurs nationwide are encouraged to participate in their local Aries and Racies groups. According to World Radio Magazine, the Federal Communications Commission has granted the state of Hawaii the right to the emergency use of four portable emergency advisory radio systems. The stations, which include police and fire stations and a checkpoint, can be used on 1620, 1650, 1670, or 1700 kilohertz. The state purchased the four 10-watt transmitters from Information Station Specialists, a Michigan manufacturer that provides transmitters for highway advisories and travelers' information. The systems include a transmitter, a digital message player, an audio mixer, a fold-out high-efficiency antenna system, and an SWR bridge. Timely communications has been an issue during the wildfire crisis on Maui. Published reports noted that the island's emergency officials failed to warn residents and tourists of the dangers by failing to use a system of outdoor sirens. There were also reports that the agency alerts were never delivered to cell phone users. One of the key arguments made by defenders for keeping AM broadcast in cars has been AM's reliability in delivering emergency information in a crisis situation. The National Association for Amateur Radio has announced that the candidates for the 2023 ARRL division elections are now official. ARRL members will choose between two candidates for director in the Great Lakes Division and two candidates for vice director in Atlantic and Dakota Divisions. In the Atlantic, Dakota, Delta, Midwest Divisions, incumbents for director are unopposed. In the Delta and Midwest Divisions, incumbents are unopposed for vice director. And the sole candidate in the Great Lakes Division for vice director is also unopposed. The following are declare elected without opposition. In Atlantic, Director Robert Famiglio, K3RF, who's held the seat since January. In the Dakota Division, Director Bill Lippert, AC0W, who's held the seat since 2021. In the Delta Division, Director David Norris, K5UZ, has served in the role since 2011, and Vice Director Ed Hudgens, WB4RHQ, who served in the role since 2013. In the Great Lakes Division, candidate Roy Hook, W8REH, will be the next Vice Director, being unopposed for the seat to be vacated by Vice Director Scott Yonnelly, N8SY. In the Midwest Division, Director Arthur Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, and Vice Director David Proper, K2DP, both of whom assumed the roles in 2021. Contested seats are as follows in the Atlantic Division. Vice Director Martin Pittenger, KB3MXM, will face challenger Robert Weinstock, W3RQ for the seat. In Dakota Division, Vice Director Lynn Nelson, W0ND, will face challenger Matthew Holden, K0BBC, who has previously held the position of Director and Vice Director. In the Great Lakes Division, Vice Director Scott Yonnelly, N8SY, will run against Michael Calter, W8CI, for the position of Division Director. Balloting for the contested seats will take place this fall. Votes will be counted and successful candidates announced in the November. 
Candidates declared elected will assume their roles for terms beginning January 1st of 2024. ARRL is governed by a board of directors. Elections are held for five of the 15 divisions each year for terms of three years. This fall, amateur radio operators will have the opportunity to volunteer their services and share their communication skills at two different marathons. With more details on these upcoming marathons, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. This fall, amateur radio operators will have two opportunities to volunteer their services and share their communication skills at different marathons. The Air Force Marathon will take place on Saturday, September 16th at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. That race will begin at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Bob Baker, N8ADO, Green County Emergency Communications Volunteer Lead for Amateur Radio Support to the Air Force Marathon, said, We need a team of ham radio volunteers to support the event by operating several networks for logistics, providing medical information, monitoring track runners, shadowing race officials, and supporting finish line operations. He went on to say we need an excess of 60 volunteers to make all of this happen. Only 75% of the required number of volunteers have signed up, and we could use amateur radio operators' help. Most of that race takes place on the Wright Pad Air Force Base, and to comply with security regulations, all volunteer applications must be submitted by August 31, 2023, to allow for background checks. As the race date nears, you will receive an invitation to a training session and a link to training materials, assignment lists, and communications plan. Please plan to arrive by 5.30 a.m. to accommodate ID checks and road closures. And the 2023 Marine Corps Marathon, MCM, will take place on Sunday, October 29th in Washington, D.C. and Arlington County, Virginia at 7.55 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The MCM Ham Volunteers team is looking for 150 amateur radio operators to support that event by providing race course situation reports. The Marine Corps Marathon, also known as the People's Marathon, expects to support more than 29,000 runners at this year's event. Amateurs can register to volunteer at hamcommunity.com slash mcm register. The mission of the MCM is to showcase physical fitness and to generate community goodwill to promote the high standards and discipline of the Marine Corps. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. To volunteer, visit usafmarathon.com slash volunteer slash and click the Volunteer Now button. You'll be redirected to the portal at raceroster.com where you'll need to create an account. Once you've created an account, Select Volunteer and sign in. Select the pull-down list under Volunteer with Us and then scroll down and select Volunteer on Saturday, September 16th, 2023. Continue to scroll down and fill out the required information. Be sure to include your call sign in the appropriate box. Below that box, under Amateur Radio Operator, click the Add to Order box. Continue to the bottom of the web page and select your t-shirt size. Then select Continue to submit your registration. Please report that you have signed in by sending a message with your name and call sign and preferred email if it's different from the account from which you send the message to afm.hams at gmail.com. The MCM is ranked as one of the largest marathon in the United States and the world. The MCM has been recognized as the best marathon in the Mid-Atlantic, best for families, and best for beginner marathoners. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. The Federal Communications Commission has announced plans to initiate a new cyber trust mark for smart devices, saying the mark will help consumers make more informed decisions about what devices to trust with their data. The FCC announced on August 10th that it is now seeking public comment on its proposal to create a voluntary cybersecurity labeling program that would provide consumers with clear information 
about the security of their Internet-enabled devices. The proposed program, where qualifying products would bear a new U.S. cyber trust mark, would help consumers differentiate trustworthy products in the marketplace and create incentives for manufacturers to meet higher cybersecurity standards, the FCC said. It said the program would be similar to the Energy Star program, which was created to help consumers identify energy-efficient appliances and encourage more companies to produce them in the marketplace, but for more cybersecure smart devices. The FCC said it created the mark in response to growing concerns about the security of interconnected devices as they become more ubiquitous in U.S. households. There are now so many new devices, from smart televisions and thermostats to home security cameras, baby monitors, and fitness trackers that are connected to the Internet, FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said. According to an FCC fact sheet, the labels would be based on criteria developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It said the logo would appear on packaging next to a QR code that could be scanned for more information. The proposal was formally adopted by the Commission August 6th and released August 10th. The public will have a chance to weigh in before the Commission votes on whether to finalize it. The first round of comments will be due 30 days after publication in the Federal Register. Bringing you this story from the Huntsville Ham Fest, in an aspiring show of camaraderie, a tight-knit ham radio community of YouTubers rallied around Renee Six KR5 SIX on Friday, August 18th, as she undertook a heart-stopping parachute jump on behalf of her husband, Vern Six KV5 SIX. Vern, who had already completed an astounding 14 jumps prior in his life, found solace in the remarkable act performed by his wife. She was able to jump in tandem with the well-known parachute mobile ham operator, also known as KD9LLN, Carlos. You can find out more about him on his YouTube channel, at Life at Terminal Velocity. He agreed to the jump and assisted her in making this daring jump. Renee, KR5SIX, was able to execute the daring jump with an impeccable precision from 12,800 feet. This achievement, recognized globally, showcases the power of unity and determination within the adventurous amateur radio community. What makes this achievement even more astonishing is that Renee's successful jump led her to become only one of five people worldwide to establish a QSO or contact under such extreme circumstances. Her first of three contacts during the canopy of 246 second descent was to her husband Vern KV5SIX. Her accomplishment adds a new dimension to the world of skydiving adventures. In a groundbreaking twist, her fearless courage made history by becoming the first female to accomplish this feat in tandem. Her unwavering courage and dedication have not only broken barriers, but also set a new standard for adventure enthusiasts and skydivers alike. It's worth noting that the Renee possesses a general class operator status, highlighting her proficiency in operating amateur radio equipment. This undoubtedly contributed to her seamless and calm communication during the heart-pounding jump, making it an even more astounding accomplishment. This event has left the indelible mark on the community, inspiring countless individuals to overcome challenges and support one another in pursuit of their dreams. As news of this extraordinary feat spreads, it's clear that this story will continue to serve as a beacon of devotion and the unbreakable spirit of adventure. Check out their YouTube page at What's Up With Six to follow them. I'm Marvin Turner, W0MET. An iconic electronic surplus store will soon be closing its doors. Phil Salati, owner of Fair Radio Sales in Lima, Ohio, says it's time to close the business. I took over the business that my dad started in 1947, and after 50 years, it's time to close the doors, he said. Salati has had an offer on the building and feels that it's time to move on. There are 30,000 square feet of equipment and parts that all need to go. Salati wants to be done with the business by October 2023, but he thinks it might take a little longer. He's even received suggestions to stay open for next year's Hamvention in Zeni, Ohio. Thousands of amateur radio operators, collectors, experimenters, and shortwave listeners have visited the store over the years. The shelves and aisles are full of old military radios and receivers. The store's fall-winter 1967 catalog lists a BC-499 FM-20, a 28-megacycle, five-channel crystal-controlled receiver with a dynamotor for $18.95, a GO-9 Navy 100-watt CW transmitter for $69.95, along with pages of meters, cords, headphones, and microphones circa 1942. Many Fair Radio sales visitors started visiting when they were young, and they continue to shop there now. 
For one radio amateur, it was a must-stop location every year on their way to Dayton Hamvention. Another amateur radio operator said he stopped there in 1980 to pick up a teletype Model 19 that still works today. Salati said he likes what he does and has enjoyed coming to work, but wonders what comes next. He said he's thinking about looking for another building and starting over. In the event of any emergency, the emergency alert system is used to communicate critical information to the public in a short amount of time. Normally, this is used for severe weather situations, amber alerts, and public safety notifications. Now, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Federal Communications Commission are planning another nationwide emergency alert test for October of 2023. The Emergency Alert System, which was formerly known as the Emergency Broadcast System, was established to provide the President of the United States with an expeditious method of communicating with the American public in the event of war, threat of war, or grave national crisis. The Emergency Broadcast System replaced the Conrad System on August 5th of 1963. In later years, it was expanded for use during peacetime emergencies at the state and local level. Although this system has never been used for a real national emergency, it has been activated more than 20,000 times between 1976 and 1996 for civil emergency messages and severe weather watches, warnings, and other hazards. The national level or presidential level tests will be done in two different parts, testing the Wireless Emergency Alerts, or WEA, and the Emergency Alert System, or EAS, capabilities. The tests will be held on Wednesday, October 4th, 2023, at approximately 2.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Here's how the two different parts of the breakdown. Wireless emergency alerts. This portion of the test will be directly towards your cell phone or wireless device. This will be the third national test, but the second test it will be sent to all cellular or wireless devices. The test message that will be sent will be in English or in Spanish, depending on the language settings of your device. Emergency Alert System. This portion of the test will be sent to all radios and televisions. This will be the seventh nationwide EIS test conducted so far. FEMA and the FCC are coordinating with EAS participants, wireless providers, emergency managers, along with other stakeholders in preparation for this national level test, to help minimize the confusion and to maximize the value of the test. The purpose of the test is to make sure that the system continues to be effective, especially for those that originate on the national level. If severe weather or other significant threats do occur and the test is postponed, the backup date for the test will be the following week, Wednesday, October 11th at 2023. The following can be expected from the nationwide test. Beginning at approximately 2.29 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, cell towers will be broadcasting the test for approximately 30 minutes. During this time, WEA-compatible wireless phones that are switched on will a range of approximately call towers and whose wireless provider participates should be capable of receiving the test message. For consumers, the message that appears on these phones will read, This is a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. No answer is re needed. All wireless systems phones should receive the message only once. Wireless emergency alerts are created and sent by authorized federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments agencies through the IPAWS to participate wireless providers, which will deliver the alert to the compatible device in geo-targeted areas. This is to help ensure that the alerts will be accessible to the entire public range, including people with disabilities. The alerts are accompanied by a unique tone and a vibration. The following can be expected from the nationwide EAS test. The EAS test portion of the test is scheduled to last approximately one minute and will be conducted with the participation of radio and TV broadcasters, cable systems, satellite radio and TV producers, and wireless video providers. The test message will be similar to the regularly monthly EAS mes test message and which the public is familiar with. This nationwide test of the emergency action system issued by the Federal Emergency Community Management Agency covers the United States from 1420 to 1450 hours EDT. This is only a test. No action is required by the public. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are 
This Week in Amateur Radio. The World Association of Christian Radio Amateurs and Listeners special event, Churches and Chapels on the Air, known as CHODA, is on Saturday, September 9th, 2023. John Ross, KD8 IDJ, is here with more. The WACRAL was started in 1957 in England by the Huddersfeld South Methodist Radio Club. CHODA is not a contest. It has been described, though, as an institutional space for using amateur radio to reach the public, like Parks on the Air, POTA. To date, though, there hasn't been any participation from amateur radio operators in the U.S. However, ARRL Delta Division Assistant Director Frank Howe, K4FMH, recently wrote to John Wurzdale, G3XYF, manager of the CHODA event, about getting the U.S. involved by activating his church in Ridland, Mississippi. To participate in the CHOTA event, send an email to Wordsdale at jhwordsdale at gmail.com with the call sign you intend to use and the location of the church or chapel that you plan to activate. Suggested frequencies for CHOTA in 2023 are 20 meters, single sideband, 40 meters, CW, and FT8. Operating times are 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'm John Ross, KD8I DJ. To participate, send an email to resdal at jhresdal at gmail.com. That's j-h-w-r-e-s-d-e-l-l at gmail.com. With the call sign you intend to use and the location of the church or chapel you plan to activate. Suggested frequencies for the event are 20 meters on single sideband, 40 meters on CW and FT8, Operating times are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Participants who make eight or more contacts will receive an award. Hello and welcome to the DX Corner for your weekly dose of DX. I'm Bill, AJ8B. The DX term of the week is actually left over from last week, DXCC endorsements. I talked about the DXCC award and the various endorsements that are associated with it. One that I mentioned, but not in any detail, was the DXCC Mobile Award. This award is available to amateurs who've contacted at least 100 DXCC entities from a vehicle capable of moving itself using only powering antennas that may be also be moved with the vehicle. Contacts made any time in the past count and proof of contact, QSL cards or LOTW, is required, but you do not need to submit them with your application. The ARL may ask for proof of contact if there are any questions or discrepancies about the claim QSO. The Mobile DXCC is a one-time award and is non-endorsable. You do not have to be an ARRL member to qualify. I was fortunate enough to confirm 153 entities from my car before I removed the rig. I hope to get it installed again soon and shoot for 200. If anyone has a question or a comment, just send me an email at thedxmentor at gmail.com and I'll do my best to research it and give you an answer. So here's what's happening in the world of DX. This section of DX News comes from Bernie, W3UR, who's the editor of the Daily DX, the Weekly DX, and the House DX column in QST. Coming soon is a rare opportunity to bag Trinidad and Martin Vaz Islands, which is number 16 on the club log DXCC Most Wanted list. Stefano, PT2IC, Vanderlei, PY2RT, and Jose, PT1 Zulu Victor, will be on site while nine other people will operate FT8 remotely. The team is still determining their equipment needs, but know that they will use multi-band vertical antennas. Operation is planned for 40 through 10 meters, plus they'll do 160 and 80 if local conditions permit. The two operating sites will be separated by three to 400 meters with the CW single sideband station at the main site and the FT8 station at the auxiliary site. Full details, including QSO information, can be found at www.pr0t.com.br slash home. Again, that's pr0t.com.br slash home. Turning our beams to the Philippines, we learned that Mike, W6QT, 
will be operating as DU3 stroke W6QT from September 1st to January 31st of 2024. He will be using an ICOM IC7300 with verticals and dipoles and will be on 80 through 6 meter sideband, FT4, FT8, and other digital modes. I hope you work, Mike. He's an excellent operator. You can QSL him direct or via LOTW or club log. Here's the latest press release from the group headed to Juan Fernandez, Charlie Baker Zero, Zulu Alpha. CB Zero's ZA plans are well underway. We're happy to announce a new addition to our team. Hal, W8HC, has decided to join us for our expedition. Hal brings a lot of knowledge and expertise for D-Expeditions. Hal earned his number one DXCC honor roll with 350 entities confirmed, and he also holds 10-band DXCC. He enjoys being on the DX side of the pileups, participating in several D-Expeditions over the past 11 years, including NH8S, VK9WA, K5P, VP6R, 3Y0Z, and KL7RRC. In the past year, he was on the K7K activation of Kiska Island, JW0A, 9Golf 4X-Ray, VP5 stroke W8HC, KH8RRC, and one of the remote members of the recent VP6A DCD expedition using the radio in the box technology. In addition to D-Expeditions, he is operated from several locations around the world, including six CQ Worldwide contests from Israel. Hal currently serves as the Secretary Treasurer of Indexa and is a proud member of the West Virginia DX Association. We are happy to have him on the team and we welcome him. And this is from the CB0ZA team. And I can tell you, I know Pal, uh, Hal personally. He is a tremendous operator and actually a very, very good guy. You can trust him and uh, I, there's probably no one I'd rather go on a de-expedition with than Hal. So good luck to you guys. Finally, here's some information on Mayotte Island, Fox Hotel, using the call sign Tango Zero, uh, I'm sorry, Tango 08 Fox Hotel. Damien, F4AZF, will be the team leader with 12 operators in total. The date is October 10th to the 22nd. The group originally thought of going to 5U, but the situation in the Africa Sahal is not good at present. So with just a few weeks to go, they've changed their plans. They now plan to be QRV on 160 through 6th and on the QO100 satellite with as many as six stations, three hex beams and verticals. You can QSL LOTW or via Fox 5 Golf Sierra Juliet. So here's a contest update. I know that the ARRL contest sheet is read elsewhere in this fine podcast and that contests I mentioned are sometimes redundant. However, there are a few contests that I have found to be especially useful to, for DXers who are trying to fill band slots or to get entities or zones in the log that may otherwise be impossible to get. So here's a couple that will assist you in that. The All Asian DX contest, Phone, will be held the weekend of September 2nd and 3rd. This contest always has great participation from Asia and Europe and is a great opportunity for you to work an all-time new one or fill some band slots. And I'm really going to go and be after uh, Vietnam and Singapore this year. Last week, I mentioned that the International DX Association, INDEXA, uh, would be starting their week-long contest. This contest starts on September 2nd and runs to September 10th. See the INDEXA website for more detail. The CW Ops CW Open Contest will be held also September 2nd, and the sessions are 000 Zulu to 359 Zulu, 1200 Zulu to 1559 Zulu, and 2000 Zulu to 2359. So there are three four hour sessions. You can enter each one individually and then enter as one uh, total score for the three sessions. It's a, just a ton of fun, and, and I really enjoy that one as well. All amateurs are encouraged to participate. Details can be found at cwops.org. As always, check the WA7BNM website for more details and other contests that I didn't mention. Until next week, this is Bill, AJ8B saying 7-3, and I hope to see you in the pileups. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available.
And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed. In, uh, we lived in Rhode Island, and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki- all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. And I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid, unusual. I would get up at 6 in the morning. Didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC. And wherever Billy Saul, Hargis, and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. My, uh, my mom, bless her heart, 83, has started posting pictures on Instagram. She's, I tried to get her into Snapchat. <laughs> Couldn't quite get her into Snapchat, but she got Instagram, and she's been posting. And she posted a picture of me as a probably four-year-old kid. And I'm wearing, for some reason, I don't know, I guess I liked hats at the time. And I'm sitting in front of a record player holding 45s and playing records. And she said, yeah, you were doing this even when you were a baby. I always thought if, uh, if I had, were born in an era before radio, I'd probably been a preacher. That's probably the closest thing, right? Every Sunday. See, I preach every Sunday, but I, I preach the gospel preach of technology. technology. Technology, put your hand on the computer. Are you in the iGen? There's a new... Na- I don't... Yeah. When I posted this on Twitter uh, a couple of few days ago, people got mad at me and said, oh, do we, do we need labels like the baby boomers, the millennials, the Gen Xers, all of that. Now, the iGen, well, yeah, maybe not, but it does kind of help to understand a little more about this uh, generation that grew up with smartphones. That's what we're calling the iGen. So they're pretty young still. Uh, they would be teen, early teens. A 16-year-old would have had access to a smartphone at the age of six. So she, she, I guess she'd be an iGenner. The iGen. Are you in the iGen? We've had a, a slew of articles over the last 10 years bemoaning the millennials. Well, if you thought that was bad, get ready. Laura, a big article by uh, Gene Twenge in The Atlantic titled, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation More Comfortable Online Than Out Partying? Post-millennials are safer physically than adolescents have ever been. That's because they never leave their bedrooms, apparently, according to this study. But they're on the brink of a mental health crisis because they're depressed. You know, my own personal experience, I have a 14-year-old at home, uh, is that it kind of confirms this a little bit. Now, I don't know. I'm curious what you think. Uh, You know, I'm a baby boomer. So uh, when I grew up in the 70s, early 70s, so I graduated from high school in 73, uh, it was all about rebellion for us, right? Getting out of the house and you got the driver's license the minute you could and all that. And I noticed with my kids who are millennials... 25 and 22, uh, the, the, well, the 25-year-old couldn't wait to get her driver's license and was devastated when she took her test and didn't pass it the first time. On the other hand, my 22-year-old, just three years difference, he didn't get it till he was about 18. He couldn't really care less because we drove him everywhere. But I think that there is a generational difference. Even three years is a generational difference. And he's kind of Let's see, eight, he was 22. To, yeah, he probably is almost iGen, right? So uh, they've been studying these kids, iGens. They're not, they're not getting jobs so much. For instance, in the late 70s, 77% of high school seniors had a job during the school year. 40 years later, only 55% did. And it's, and it's accelerating. The iGens apparently spend a lot of time looking into screens, not TV so much as computers and more than that, even smartphones, 
more than tablets, smartphones. Uh, they uh, they don't they don't hang out with friends so much when they go to the mall. Remember remember going to the mall, kids. <laughs> Everybody went to the mall. When they go to the mall, they go with their parents. They go less and less with uh, the friends or by themselves. They are driving at a later age. They're dating at a, a much later age. And if you look at the the graphs in this Atlantic article. They put on the graph, they could put this line where the iPhone was released in 2007, and you could see the, the drop, the dramatic drop in, uh, in dating, in sex. Uh, they're sexually active later. See, all of these things, some par- parents would say, wait, that's, what's wrong with that? Ah, but then there is some bad stuff. They're more likely to feel lonely. Big spike in, uh, in that metric since the iPhone came out. Big spike. A third often feel lonely and often feel left out. They're less likely to get enough sleep. Does your a teenager, your preteen sleep with their phone in bed? Ours do. We have to take it away from them. Now, I know, and when I posted this again, people say, oh, let's not create labels. Yeah, and you're right. You know, this is all generalizations. Every kid's different. Every person's different. And they said, let's, let's, we shouldn't shame them. And, and after all, didn't they say the same thing about kids playing video games and kids wa- when, <laughs> watching TV? I know my parents said, you can't watch more than half an hour of TV a day. <gasps> oh, that was terrible. Because there were, <laughs> there were two shows I wanted to watch. And I couldn't watch an hour long. My man from Uncle was an hour long. Couldn't watch that. So they were worried then. And, you know, uh, somebody pointed out people were worried the kids would spend too much time reading books <laughs> uh, 50, 60 years ago. Too much time reading books. <laughs> oh, I wish they'd read books today, don't you? And, and, and she's very quick to point out in her article in The Atlantic that it's not a good thing uh, or a bad thing. It's neither. It's just a, an observation about how young people are growing up. And like anything, there's positives and there's negatives. I remember my friend uh, John said his teenager was a better driver because he'd spent his youth playing driving games on the computer. (laughs) I don't know if that's true. Uh, What do you think? I I I like the name the iGen. I'm gonna I'm gonna give. uh, Give Gene a credit for that. Gene Gene Twenge get 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 credit for the iGen. But uh, and and I think that these observations are, at least are accurate with the with the early teens that I know, my son's friends. That's spent a lot of time in front of that screen, uh, and a lot of time in their room, and less time going out. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, the county fairs in town, the Sonoma County Fair. We said to Mike, "You want to go to the fair? No, I just want to stay home." His friends called. You want to go to a movie? No, nah, nah, I'm just gonna stay home. What do you think? I mean, the millennials grew up with the web, but the difference is with the iPhone and the smartphone, it's, in, it's, it's, it's not just growing up with the web. It's with you at every moment of night and day, all the time. In 2017, a survey of 5,000 American teens found out that 75% of them, three out of four, owned an iPhone. Not just any phone, an iPhone. And that's why Apple is soon to be a trillion-dollar company. <laughs> and this Apple stock price went up. And people are all excited about augmented reality. Ooh, ooh, really? A reality? I can, I can use my phone and that'll be reality? You got it. Bingo. What are we going to call the next gen? I don't know. <laughs> the iPhone gen. Remember, did you ever have... Uh, are you old enough to remember? Stop reading and go out and play. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. 
You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. On November 2, 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected President of the United States. Millions read the election results in the newspapers the next day. In the Pittsburgh area, however, hundreds heard the election returns the moment they were wired in, thanks to Dr. Frank Conrad, a Westinghouse employee who broadcast the results over 8XK, his amateur station. This station would evolve into KDKA, and the night of November 2nd, 1920, has been called the start of the multi-billion dollar broadcast industry. But was it? Let's take a look at the evolution of broadcasting and the amateur's role in it. The idea of broadcasting was first considered by Lee DeForest in May 1902, when he wrote that ultimately wireless telephony will be possible. He urged the financial backers of the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Company to develop and patent the concept. The stockholders, however, were more interested in immediate profits through massive stock sales rather than genuine development and refused to finance the necessary research. Undaunted, DeForest in 1907 formed the DeForest Radio Telephone Company. In a statement that for 1907 must have appeared to be radical or even bizarre, but was amazingly prophetic, he wrote, I look forward to the day when opera may be brought into every home. Someday the news and even advertising will be sent out over the wireless telephone. Despite DeForest's intense interest in this area, he was not the first to broadcast the human voice and music over the airwaves. That honor belongs to Reginald Fessenden, a Canadian professor. He was the first to recognize the inherent flaw in the concept of spark transmissions and set out to find an alternative. His quest led him to Schenectady, New York, and the services of General Electric's most brilliant scientist, Charles Steinmetz. Fessenden explained his idea, an alternator capable of generating waves of 100,000 cycles per second, or 3,000 meters. Steinmetz and his assistant, Ernst Alexanderson, worked for almost two years and finally produced an alternator that met Fessenden's requirements. The Alexanderson alternator, as it was now known, was delivered to Fessenden Station in the fall of 1906. On the evening of December 24, 1906, ship and amateur operators heard something in their headphones they had never heard before. Someone speaking. A woman singing. Someone reading a poem. Fessenden himself played the violin. Not to be outdone, DeForest continued his radio telephone experiments in the period of 1907 through 1910, Broadcasting from the Eiffel Tower and live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, where Enrico Caruso was singing. However, all of these transmissions had one major problem. Without a pure, stable, direct, current CW carrier to modulate, all of the signals had a background whine and distortion. Real development in the area of modulated carriers would have to wait until Armstrong discovered the oscillating properties of a regenerative circuit. By 1916, both Armstrong's circuit and the Audion were widely circulating in the radio world and broadcasting surfaced again. Lee DeForest resumed his transmissions with programs of good music, culture, and lectures. DeForest can be credited with two firsts in 1916, the first advertisements for his Audion and other products, and the broadcast of the presidential election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Evans Hughes. Unfortunately, DeForest signed off before the California results were in, so he declared Hughes the winner over Wilson. Also in 1916, amateur station 2ZK broadcast one hour of music each night. David Sarnoff, who had manned his station during the Titanic disaster, also got into the act. He wrote a memo to his employers at American Marconi suggesting a radio music box, which would become a household utility. He went on to describe his vision of radio broadcasting and then turned to finances. He predicted an income of $75 million a year from the sales of receivers. 
Marconi, still focusing on ship-to-shore telegraphy, took no action on the memo. After amateurs had returned to the air in November of 1919, hundreds of them began to explore the area of broadcasting. In May 1920, amateur station 8XK joined many other hams in the transmission of music. Incidentally, it was legal for amateurs to broadcast music, news, sports, lectures, advertisements, or indeed just about anything else they wanted. The Radio Act of 1912, still in effect, did not mention amateurs. Rather, one paragraph made a general reference to individual private or commercial stations. The only real restriction was the 1 kilowatt power limit and the 200 meter wavelength. After that, the government didn't care. Thus, those amateurs who had built equipment to modulate their CW transmitters eventually played a phonograph record or two, sang, or tried to sing, or broadcast some form of entertainment. With all of the above documented evidence, why is November 2nd, 1920 considered the start of broadcasting? The answer lies not at the transmitter, but at the receiver. Prior to that night, all broadcasts had, in effect, been from one amateur to another or to a commercial station. The November broadcast, though, was designed and promoted by Westinghouse as a transmission to the general public. Starting in September, stores were selling basic receivers for $10 to receive 8XK. Westinghouse, in effect, had seized DeForest and Sarnoff's idea and was marketing it to the general public. Thus, it was the makeup of the listening audience that defined the start of broadcasting. When the word of this successful transmission got out, more amateurs got into the act and set up their own little broadcast stations. By the end of 1921, it was estimated that about 1,200 amateurs had made at least one broadcast. Some had a regular schedule of programs and would evolve into commercial stations. Others did it just out of curiosity. But there were listeners. Over 400,000 people heard the Dempsey Carpenter fight on July 2nd, 1921. Radio sales were approaching 100,000 per year, not counting crystal sets, which were selling at the rate of 20,000 per month. However, with this explosive growth came two problems for the amateur. The first was an identity crisis. What should the role of the amateur be in broadcasting? Some thought that we should stay out of it and just stick to traffic handling on CW. Others envisioned the amateur as a jack of all trades, expert CW operator and relay station, as well as community broadcaster. In fact, a new name evolved to describe this amateur broadcast hybrid, citizen radio or wireless. Even QST was confused. For a period of time in 1921, the word citizen replaced amateur on the front cover. The other problem was frequencies. Everyone, amateur, broadcaster, and hybrid, was on 200 meters. Tuning across the dial in 1921, one would hear mostly CW, a few spark holdouts, and the new broadcasters. While the amateurs were used to the interference, the general listening public was not. They had purchased their radios to hear music, not CW. Complaints started to pour into the Secretary of Commerce. Legally, he was powerless as the Radio Act of 1912 offered no solutions. A conference was called for all interested parties held in Washington in February 1922 to try to resolve the impending crisis. Even though he was exceeding his authority under the Radio Act, Secretary Hoover was able to get the following proposals accepted at the conference. One. Henceforth, special broadcast licenses would be issued. Two frequencies would be available for broadcasters immediately. 360 meters, or 833 kilocycles, for regular transmissions, and 485 meters, or 619 kilocycles, for crop reports and weather forecasts. 2. After the marine interest had abandoned the 220 to 545 meter range, or 1363 to 550 kilocycles, it would be turned over to broadcasting. 3. Broadcasting was forbidden by amateurs who were defined for the first time by his name as stations operating without pay or commercial gain merely for personal interest. 4. Quiet hours were imposed on all amateur stations effective from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. daily and on Sunday morning. The fact that the number of broadcasting stations dropped from 1,200 to 30 immediately after these regulations went into effect, shows just how many amateurs were in fact pioneer broadcasters. This agreement, however, was a house of cards. Secretary Hoover had stretched his authority under the Radio Act of 1912 well past the breaking point. 
1926, the cards came tumbling down and the summer of anarchy was ushered in. How would amateurs fare with no enforceable regulations in place? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives explores the events leading up to the creation of the Federal Radio Commission. This is Bill Cottonelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio There's nothing quite as satisfying as the click of a well-designed piece of equipment. It's something that tickles the brain and done well, it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. If time was on my side and I wasn't going somewhere else with this, I'd now regale you with research on the phenomenon. I'd explore the community of people building mechanical keyboards and those who restore equipment to their former glory. Instead, I'm encouraging you to dig whilst I talk about the second and third harmonics. This is about amateur radio, after all. Over the years, there's been a steady stream of commentary around the quality of handheld radios. Some suggest that the cheaper the radio, the worse it is. Given that these kinds of radios are often the very first purchase for an aspiring amateur, it would be useful to have a go at exploring this. When a radio is designed, the aim is for it to transmit exactly where it's intended to, and only there. Any transmission that's not where you plan is considered a spurious emission. By carefully designing a circuit, by adding shielding, by filtering and other techniques, these spurious emissions can be reduced or eliminated. But this costs money, either in the design stage or in the cost of materials and manufacturing. It's logical to think that the cheaper the radio, the worse it is. But is it really true that a cheap radio has more spurious emissions than an expensive one? To give you an example of a spurious emission, consider an FM transmitter tuned to the 2 meter amateur band. Let's say 146.5 MHz. If you key the radio when all is well, the radio will only transmit at that frequency. But that's not always the case. It turns out that if you were to listen on 293 MHz, you might discover that your radio is also transmitting there. If you're familiar with the amateur radio band plan, you'll know that 293 MHz is not allocated as an amateur frequency, so we're not allowed to transmit there. In fact, in Australia, that frequency is reserved for the Australian Department of Defence, and there's an additional exclusion for the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. 293 MHz isn't a random frequency. It's twice 146.5 MHz, and it's called the second harmonic. There's more. If you multiply the base frequency by 3, you end up at 439.5 MHz, the third harmonic. In Australia, that frequency falls into the amateur allocation as a second use. Its primary use is again the Department of Defence. These two transmissions are examples of spurious emissions. To be clear, the transmitter is tuned to 146.5 MHz, and these unintended extra signals come out of the radio at the same time. This is bad for several reasons, legal and otherwise. The first obvious one is that you're transmitting out of band, which as an amateur you already have no excuse for, since getting your license requires you to understand that this is strictly not allowed. The International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, has specific requirements for what's permitted in the way of spurious emissions from an amateur station. Spurious emissions also mean that there is energy being wasted. Instead of the signal only coming out at the intended frequency, some of it is appearing elsewhere, making the 5 watts you paid for less effective than you hoped for. So what's this got to do with the click I started with? Well, thanks to Randall, Victor Kilo 6 Whiskey Romeo, I have on loan a heavy box with a cathode ray tube or green CRT screen, lots of buttons and knobs, and the ability to measure such spurious emissions. It's marked HP 8920A RF Communications Test Set. 
Using this equipment is very satisfying. You switch it on and a fan starts whirring. After a moment, you hear a beep. Then the screen announces itself, almost as if there's a PC in there somewhere. Turns out that there is, and the beep is the power on self-test or post beep. Originally released in 1992, this magic box can replace 22 instruments for transceiver testing. I started downloading user manuals. Oh boy, there's lots to learn. Bringing back lots of memories, it even has a programming language, Instrument Basic, to control it. Where have you been all my life? Turns out that in 1992, this piece of kit cost as much as my car. Anything for the hobby, right? At the next Hamfest, I'll be using it to measure as many handhelds as I can get my hands on, and taking notes. I have no idea how many I'll be able to test, but I'm looking forward to putting some numbers against the repeated claims of quality and price. I can tell you that a couple of weeks ago, I got together with Randall and Glyn, Victor Kilo 6 Papa Alpha Whiskey, and spent an enjoyable afternoon testing several radios, and there are some surprising results already. Perhaps this is something you might attempt at your next community event. Gather data rather than opinions. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. In Pakistan, a massive antenna project is being built to bring Digital Radio Mondial service to the nation's public radio listeners and beyond. Calling Radio Pakistan's analog and shortwave broadcast technology outdated, the nation's Minister for Information and Broadcasting formally launched a project on July 30 designed to bring the 1,000 kilowatt digital signals from the public broadcaster to listeners in Pakistan. The upgrade begins at a time when the majority of Radio Pakistan's transmitters have been declared obsolete and have been shut down. According to the DRM website, DRM was approved in January of 2020 as the standard in Pakistan for all frequency bands on AM and FM broadcast radio. The Minister for Information and Broadcasting said that the boost in signal strength and range will benefit listeners in the Middle East, the Far East, Central Asia, South Asia, and Eastern Europe. And according to the DRM website, DRM technology is enjoying a robust rollout elsewhere. 35 medium wave transmitters are sending signals to more than 900 million people in India, where cars are also being outfitted with DRM receivers. Indonesia, China, and Romania are among the many nations that also have various forms of DRM in broadcasting. Some of the world's top hackers worked their way into an orbiting CubeSat known as Moonlighter to help the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Space Force expose vulnerabilities that could pose cybersecurity threats. The global competition known as Hackasat 4 recently announced the winners following the finalist rounds held in August. A team from Italy known as Hackeroni captured the top honors. With skills in RF communications, reverse engineering, satellite operations, and vulnerability research paramount to success, a group of 40 full-time Northrop Grumman employees known as Space Bits R Us took up the challenge too, landing the fourth place spot. A number of hams were on the team, including Brian Wilkins, KO4AQF, and Wyatt Neal, KD8AQS, the team hacking lead. Brian, who is a satellite enthusiast, a former AMSAT member, and a recipient of the Satellite VUCC Award, said in an email that being a ham helps deliver relevant skills for this kind of challenge. He said operators gain expertise in radio wave propagation, modulation, and antenna design, allowing them to understand satellite communication protocols and frequencies. Additionally, knowledge of software-defined radio technology enables intercepting, decoding, or modifying satellite signals. It has clearly paid off, not just for the government-sponsored contest, but for the Northrop Grumman team as well, which placed second in the finals for Hackasat 3. The real prize, however, is awareness. As Brian went on to say, this serves as a wake-up call to the industry. Obscurity does not equal security. The Radio Society of Great Britain Intruder Watch Service is looking for a volunteer to act as coordinator when Richard Lamont, G4, DYA, retires from the role in September 2023. The function of the Intruder Watch Service is to monitor and receive reports of intrusions of non-amateur transmissions into amateur radio bands and to collate reports and alert Ofcom to persistent and regular intruders. The responsibilities of the volunteer include submitting details of intruders to the International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System on behalf of the United Kingdom, membership of the RSGB Spectrum Forum, and providing reports for the Spectrum Forum, RADCOM, and the RSGB Yearbook. The successful applicant for the position will have a station capable of reliable monitoring of amateur bands, up-to-date knowledge of transmission modes and modulation methods in order to be able to identify transmissions, 
and the ability to receive reports of intruders from other amateur stations by email. If you're interested in finding out more about this role, please email the RSGB Spectrum Forum Chair, Murray Neiman, G6JYB, at spectrum.chairman at rsgb.org.uk. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Bruce Page, KK5DO, is here with this week's AMSAT report. Bruce? Thank you, John. As many of you know, or might not know, the ISS is full of ham radio equipment. You will find the packet system, an FM repeater, and periodically SSTV events. What is maybe rarer to find is an astronaut making random contacts. If you would like your best shot at making one, you need to listen at very specific times, on weekdays, one hour after they wake up, or about an hour before they go to bed. They have an hour of free time. They wake up at 0730 UTC and go to bed at 1930 UTC. The rest of the time is their work day, and you can appreciate that for the cost of maintaining astronauts on the ISS, and all the experiments, work really pays the bills. On the weekends, they are free to do what they like. Some hams are very prolific in making contacts, others not so much. Keep in mind that the radios are turned off during EVAs as a safety measure. You can get all the frequencies for the radios in the Columbus module, as well as the service module at eris.org by clicking on General Contacts. Once you're successful in making your contact, visit eris.org again. Click on General Contacts and then QSL Information. You most definitely want to get that card. I was fortunate to have made contacts during shuttle missions and from the mirror. Good luck. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Thanks, Bruce, for that report. It is time for the Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that five new sunspot groups emerged this week, one on August 17th, another on August 18th, and two more on the 21st, and one more on August 22nd. The average daily sunspot numbers rose slightly from 95.7 to 105.9, while the average daily solar flux declined from 154.2 to 149.4. There weren't any big geomagnetic events this week to report. The average daily planetary A and dice changed from 6 to 8.4, while the average daily middle latitude index changed from 7.7 .7 to 10.1. As the sun nears the peak of its current solar cycle, our star is growing increasingly active, and the peak may be occurring sooner than predicted, according to scientists. Every 11 years or so, the sun experiences periods of low and high solar activity, which is associated with the amount of sunspots on its surface. These dark regions, some of which can reach the size of the Earth or larger, are driven by the sun's strong and constantly shifting magnetic fields. Over the course of a solar cycle, the sun will transition from a calm to an intense active period. During the peak of activity, called solar maximum, the sun's magnetic poles flip. Then the sun will grow quiet again during a solar minimum, Initially, peak activity was forecast to begin in July of 2025. Now, the experts believe the cyclical peak is more likely to take place in mid to late 2024. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux will be 155 on August 26th, 160, 165, and 165 on August 27th through the 29th, 160 and 165 on August 30th and September 1st, It'll be 163 and 160 on September 2nd and 3rd, and 162 on the 4th and 5th of September. Looking at the predicted planetary A and dice, it'll be 5, 10, and 8 on August 26th through the 28th, 
5 on August 29th, all the way through September 5th, and then 10, 8, and 8 on September 6th through the 8th. In Radio Sport this week, the year-long ARRO Volunteers on the Air Vota event continues. At their website, you can see the state activation schedule for weekly W1AW portable operations, including August 23rd through the 29th, North Dakota, W1AW slash 0, and Idaho, W1AW slash 7. At August 30th through September 5th, Ohio, W1AW slash 8, and Arizona, W1AW slash 7. Coming contest on August 26th through the 28th, it's the Hawaii QSO party, CW, phone and digital there. And then on August 26th through the 27th, there are a lot of contests. First, the Alara contest, CW and phone. The WVE Islands QSO party, CW, phone and digital. The YODX HF contest, that's CW and phone. The Worldwide Digi DX Contest, FT4 and FT8 there. The Kansas QSO Party, CW Phone and Digital. The Ohio QSO Party, CW and Phone. The CVA DX Contest, that's Single Sideband and Phone. And the 50 MHz Fall Sprint. Those are all on August 26th through the 27th. And on August 27th, the SARL HFCW Contest, that's CW. And on August 27th, the NJQRP Skeeter Hunt. CW and phone. Upcoming section state and division conventions on August 25th through the 27th. It's the Northeast Ham Exposition hosting the ARRL New England Division Convention. That's in Marlboro, Massachusetts. September 1st through the 3rd, the Shelby Ham Fest hosting the ARRL North Carolina Section Convention in Shelby, North Carolina. September 10th, the ARRL Southern New Jersey Section Convention and Ham Fest in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. And on September 22nd through the 23rd, the HRO Superfest, hosting the ARRO Wisconsin State Convention. That's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The Federal Communications Commission has opened the application window for its Fall 2024 Attorney Honors Program, designed to recruit entry-level attorneys. The application process concludes on Monday, September 25th. The FCC's Attorney Honors Program offers a unique opportunity for graduating law students and current judicial clerks to work on legal and policy changes in the communications and technology sectors. The focus areas include advancing access to essential communications for all Americans, protecting consumer rights, reviewing significant mergers and acquisitions, and emphasizing public safety. Selected candidates will join a two-year employment and training program to gain exposure to the field of communications law and policy, benefiting from a broad array of learning experiences. The selection process for the program is highly competitive, evaluating various aspects of the candidate's profile, such as academic achievements, writing skills, extracurricular activities, and interest in government service or the communications industry. The application process will be held through the FCC Jobs web-based recruitment system integrated with the USA Jobs website. Applicants must provide all necessary documents, including a cover letter, resume, law school transcript, writing sample, and references. Incomplete or late applications will not be entertained. Interested candidates can find further information on the Attorney Honors Program webpage. Papers are now being accepted for the 41st Annual AMSET Space Symposium to be held on the weekend of October 20th through the 21st, 2023 at the Sheraton DFW Airport in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Proposals for symposium papers and presentations are invited on any topic of interest to the amateur satellite community. We request a tentative title of your presentation as soon as possible, with final copies submitted by October 12th for inclusion in the symposium proceedings. Abstracts and papers should be sent to Dan Schultz, N8FGV, at N8FGV at AMSAT.org. The doors to research at the world-renowned Arecibo Observatory have been shut more than two years after the collapse of the facility's 305-meter-wide dish, an instrument that once tracked asteroids, gravitational waves, and exoplanets. The site's conversion into a STEM education and research center was originally planned for this year, but has taken longer than expected. Proposals were invited in late 2022, with the agency setting a February 2023 deadline for all those interested. So far, no decision has been announced. In the months following the collapse in 2020 of its iconic radio telescope, the observatory reopened its visitor center and observation deck. Scientists continued their research with other tools at the facility. 
All that has ceased, as Arecibo, the site where the first binary pulsar was discovered, now ponders its future. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. The Federal Communications Commission is seeking public comment on the feasibility, benefits, and limitations of techniques that can help advance the FCC's understanding of non-federal spectrum usage. The FCC has exclusive jurisdiction over all uses of the spectrum, except for that allocated for federal government use. In particular, the FCC is interested in how it can leverage new technologies, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, to manage and support non-federal spectrum usage. This update summarizes the new proceeding, launched through a notice of inquiry released earlier this month, in which comments are due on October 3rd, 2023, and replies are due by November 2nd, 2023. Currently, the FCC has limited access to real-time data regarding spectrum usage. For instance, its database for most wireless radio licenses, known as the Universal Licensing System, contains limited information on the identity of the licensees, the intensity and patterns of spectrum usage by those licensees, the precise purposes for the licenses, and the spectrum bands in which the licensees operate. Previous government inquiries have underscored the barriers to collect real-time spectrum use data. For example, in 2014, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration found real-time monitoring could improve spectrum management, but identified cost, band-specific considerations, and data collection requirements as challenges to such efforts. Now, the FCC is hoping recent technological advances will improve real-time monitoring. One of the key inquiries in the Notice of Inquiry concerns how spectrum usage should be defined and whether existing definitions are useful to understanding and managing non-federal spectrum. Among other things, the FCC is evaluating which discrete components, geography, frequency, time, etc., could inform such a definition and how to combine those metrics to obtain a holistic understanding of the spectrum or band. Use of non-federal spectrum also varies by band, with different bands having different requirements or technical characteristics. The FCC is seeking public input on whether this fact weighs against the adoption of a single definition for spectrum uses. Use of non-federal spectrum also varies by band, with different bands having different requirements or technical characteristics. The FCC is seeking public input on whether this fact weighs against the adoption of a single definition for spectrum usage, and if so, how the definition may change across the bands. The FCC also seeks comment on how it should prioritize data collection based on the specific issues and challenges of each band. The Notice of Inquiry poses questions about how to overcome the barriers to real-time monitoring and data collection. Among other things, the FCC is seeking to understand whether costs with respect to data monitoring have decreased and whether newer methodologies such as crowdsourcing, external data sources, modeling, and direct observation can or should be used. Finally, the Notice of Inquiry invites comment on any concerns that may arise with respect to its data collection goals, particularly those related to data protection, privacy, and security. The Notice of Inquiry further offers the public a meaningful opportunity to weigh in on how non-federal spectrum may be put to best use in the digital age. Central among these uses is artificial intelligence and machine learning. It is particularly noteworthy that in her statement accompanying the NOI, FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel highlighted the value that AI and machine learning could bring to the Internet of Things, device management, network resiliency efforts, and a host of other advances. By better understanding spectrum utilization, the FCC hopes to be able to allocate spectrum in ways that foster a vibrant and more efficient technological ecosystem. According to an advisory published by the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, the FBI, and the Air Force, SpaceX and Blue Origin could be targets of espionage efforts by China and Russia. They see U.S. space-related innovation and assets as potential threats, 
as well as valuable opportunities to acquire vital technologies and expertise, the advisory says. The advisory lists aerospace as a major growth industry on a global scale and estimates it could be worth as much as $1 trillion annually by 2030. It says the United States is a driving force behind aerospace innovation and many military and civilian applications depend on space assets. This includes GPS, communications, emergency services, energy, and agriculture. SpaceX has already dealt with Russian attacks against its internet providing Starlink satellites and shored up their ability to resist signal jamming. It provides satellite internet connectivity with Ukraine, which it uses to support its defense against the Russian invasion that began in February. Elon Musk has mentioned that providing internet service in a war zone is expensive and likely because good cybersecurity doesn't come cheap. However, SpaceX has negotiated a deal with the Pentagon to continue providing internet access to the Ukraine. Besides potentially angering Russia by providing internet access to Ukraine, SpaceX began encrypting telemetry data from its rocket launches after some ham radio amateurs were found intercepting and deciphering plain text data and photos from the launch. Foreign nationals may target SpaceX's and Blue Origin's IT infrastructure to uncover intellectual property and other trade secrets that cost companies time and resources to develop. So SpaceX could reasonably be annoyed by efforts to reverse engineer its Starlink signals purely because they could be used to produce counterfeit Starlink kits, even if somebody did figure out how to do something cool, like using Starlink as an alternative to GPS. SpaceX has also promoted Starships as a rocket that could become the world's most powerful launch vehicle once it becomes operational. China would very likely be interested in getting its hands on the technical details. Like SpaceX, Elon Musk's other companies, such as Tesla, have been targets for cybersecurity threats. A Russian national pled guilty to charges related to a case in which he attempted to bribe a Tesla employee to inject ransomware into the company's IT infrastructure. The Tesla has sued the former employees, such as Martin Tripp and Alex Kotlikov, for attempts to steal or leak sensitive documents. Many similar incidents are inside jobs or social engineering attacks, as demonstrated by cybersecurity expert Kevin Mitnick. The advisory encouraged aerospace companies to shore up their cybersecurity to ensure that the United States and these companies can remain competitive. SpaceX has already demonstrated its ability to act as a backup launch service in case global politics leave companies like OneWeb and space agencies like the ESA scrambling. However, the advisory headed by the National Counterintelligence and Security Center expressed concern that Russia and China could cheat by hacking into SpaceX's and Blue Origin systems and stealing their documents. Four crew members now are assigned to launch on NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission for a long-duration stay aboard the International Space Station. NASA made the announcement on August 4th. NASA astronauts Commander Matthew Dominic, KC-0-TOR, Pilot Michael Barrett, KD-5-MIJ, and Mission Specialist Jeanette Epps, KF-5-QNU, along with Roscosmos Cosmonaut Mission Specialist Alexander Grabankin, will join Expedition 70 and 71 crew members aboard the station in early 2024 to conduct a wide-ranging set of operational and research activities. This will be the first spaceflight for Dominic, who became a NASA astronaut in 2017. He's from Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of San Diego, California, and a master's in systems engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He is an active-duty U.S. Navy astronaut. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School in Patuxent River, Maryland, and then served as a test pilot specializing in testing landing on and catapult launches from the U.S. Navy aircraft carriers. This will be Barrett's third trip to the space station. In 2009, Barrett served as the flight engineer for Expeditions 19 and 20 as the station transitioned its standard crew complement from 3 to 6 and performed two spacewalks. He flew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in 2011 on STS-133, which delivered the permanent multi-purpose module and fourth express logistics carrier. He has spent a total of 212 days in space. Born in Vancouver, Washington, he considers Camas, Washington to be his hometown. Barrett earned a bachelor's in zoology from the University of Washington, Seattle, and a doctor of medicine from Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. He completed residencies in internal medicine at Northwestern and aerospace medicine along with a master's degree at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. After nine years as a NASA flight surgeon and project physician, 
Barrett joined the astronaut corps in 2000. This will also be Epps' first trip to the space station. She's from Syracuse, New York, and earned a bachelor's in physics from Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, and a master's in science and a doctorate in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland, College Park. Prior to joining NASA, she worked at Ford Motor Company and the Central Intelligence Agency. She was selected as an astronaut in July 2009 and has served on the generic joint operation panel working on space station crew efficiency, as a crew support astronaut for two expeditions, and as lead capsule communicator in the Mission Control Center at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Epps previously was assigned to NASA's Boeing Starliner 1 mission. NASA reassigned Epps to allow Boeing time to complete development of Starliner, while also continuing plans for astronauts to gain spaceflight experience for future mission needs. Grabankin, who graduated from Ukutsk High Military Aviation School, Irkutsk, Russia, majoring in engineering, maintenance, and repair of aircraft radio navigation systems, also was flying on his first mission. He graduated from Moscow Technical University of Communications and Informatics with a degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. This is the eighth rotational mission to the space station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program, which works with the American aerospace industry to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation to and from the orbital outpost on American-made rockets and spacecraft launching from American soil. Meanwhile, crew members who will soon fly aboard NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 mission will enter quarantine Friday in one of the major milestones before they head to the launch site in Florida to start their mission to the International Space Station. The process of flight crew health stabilization is a routine part of final preparations for all missions to the space station. Spending the final two weeks before liftoff and quarantine will help ensure Crew-7 members are healthy as well as protect the astronauts already on the space station. Commander Jasmine Mobelli, KI-5 WSL, Danish ESA pilot Andreas Morgensen, KG-5 GCZ, JAXA mission specialist Satoshi Furukawa, KE-5 DAW, and cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov are now scheduled to launch to the International Space Station on August 25th. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. The ARRL Simulated Emergency Test, or SET, is on the horizon, and you'll want to be ready, not only at the individual operator and station level, but also within your amateur community, ARRL section, and beyond. October 7th and 8th is the main focal point weekend for this year's National Emergency Exercise that will test your skills and test the preparedness of many organizations who are called into action when actual emergency situations warrant. ARRL field organization leaders, such as section managers, section emergency coordinators, section traffic managers, district emergency coordinators, emergency coordinators, net managers, and all of their assistants, too, are among the many amateur radio operators who are developing plans and scenarios for this year's set. Working together, the simulated emergency test invites all amateur radio operators to become better aware of emergency preparedness and the training that is available. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, the National Traffic System, Skywarn, Community Emergency Response Teams, Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, and other auxiliary communications groups and public service-oriented radio amateurs are encouraged to participate. This annual nationwide exercise presents an important opportunity to test one's training and to develop new skills as well. It's a prominent time to work with partner organizations and served agencies to get to know them better and to learn what their needs may be in advance of an emergency or disaster situation. For many decades, the ARRL has established working national relationships with organizations and agencies like the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the American National Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the National Weather Service, National Communications System, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials International, Citizen Corps, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, REACT International, the Society of Broadcast Engineers, and the Boy Scouts of America. More details on these particular organizations and how they work with the ARRL and amateur radio operators can be found on the ARRL webpage. 
getting to know these organizations at the local, section, and state levels, and how to work together for effective emergency and public service is an important goal. The annual simulated emergency test provides the chance, and you and the radio amateurs of your community help make it happen. To find out how to get involved in this year's set, please contact your local ARRL emergency coordinator or net manager. Check on upcoming planned activities through local, state, or section-wide nets. Contact your local club or other area clubs to find out who the emergency coordinator is and where the nearest Aries group meets or which area it serves. In consideration of local and section-wide schedules and schedules with partner organizations and served agencies, ARRL field organization leaders have the option of conducting their simulated emergency test at another time if the main set weekend of October 7th and 8th is not the best for all concerned. Consult with your local section field organization leaders for details. Additional background on the annual set is presented in the article Simulated Emergency Test 2022 Results in the July 2023 issue of QST. Also, guidelines and specific set reporting forms for ARRL section and field organization leaders and reporting participants are linked on the ARRL website. If you are the emergency coordinator, net manager, or a section leader who is in charge of reporting this year's set activity on behalf of your group, please fill out online reporting forms on the ARRL website. Dogs are an integral part of the physiotherapy practice that Hans von der Poel, YL3JD, and his wife Sandra operate in Latvia. The family dogs greet and cheer all the couple's clients when they arrive, putting them at ease. Dogs also play a major role for Hans at this time of year through a special event station, YL1DOG, which Hans activates annually in August in honor of International Dog Day on the 26th of the month. He's joined this year by two hams in the UK, Chris, G5VZ, and David, G4YVM. They are operating as GB0DOG and GB4DOG, respectively. The three have been on the air using CW since Monday, August 21st. The special event concludes on Saturday, August 26th. Hans said that he was inspired by a special event held three years ago, marking International Cat Day. Hans said he's raising awareness of the need to help pets who need homes. He said, in my power as a radio amateur and an animal lover, bringing attention to those abandoned pets is the least I can do. In countries all over the world, the animal shelters are packed with cats and dogs, and I feel obligated to expose this. It's no surprise that the couple's dogs are former shelter animals they adopted almost immediately after emigrating to Latvia from the Netherlands. It's also no surprise that next year Hans plans to be back on the air with even more special event operators around the world. The first World HEMA, that's H-E-M-A, day is to take place on September 1st and 2nd, bringing with it an opportunity for light exercise, fresh air, and perhaps some DX radio contacts first that can qualify you for various certificates in the HEMA Awards Scheme. The Summit Awards Scheme started in the UK but has spread across Europe into Australia and is growing in Asia, Canada, and Oceania. HEMA summits are open 24-7, but this special day from 1200 UTC on Friday, September 1st to 1200 UTC on Saturday, September 2nd gives the added advantage of concentrating the activity with the possibility of HEMA to HEMA contacts, perhaps with new DXCCs in the scheme and certainly in some never before activated summits. You can visit www.hema.com Dot org, that's H-E-M-A dot org dot U-K, to get the full details of this event and all of the other HEMA awards. But most of all, if you can, get out and enjoy being on the air in the fresh air. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Hey, guess what? I can't see the VU meter for where I am, so I'm going to have to just kind of wing it. I wanted to do a segment for this series while working on a tower, but as usual, Mother Nature changed my mind. So here we are again from the comfy confines of good old Studio B. As winter sets in where you live, we're often reminded of those nasty little chores we put off all summer up on our ham towers, and I'm no exception to this rule. I always put off for winter what could be more easily done during the summer. The fall is actually a good time for tower work. In many parts of the USA, there are predictable dry spells during the change of seasons. 
the slowing of grass and weeds, gives us a good chance to inspect the tower base bolts, clamps, and any grounding hardware. This is also a good time for spraying a good amount of herbicide around tower bases, grounding systems, fences, guy anchors, and other tower parts. It's also a good time to look down on the ground around the base of the tower for any parts that may have broken off during the summer storms that you may have not noticed from a distance. It's a good idea to always keep the tower base area free from debris and junk. So anything falling from the tower is immediately visible. Tell the person that mows the grass to always watch for stuff on the ground. Keep it picked up and report anything he finds on the ground. A clean gravel ground cover around the tower base is in your best interest as a tower owner or tower user. So go outside tomorrow and clean up everything around the base of the tower. Make sure everyone else that works around the tower does the same thing. This is one of the best ways to notice problems before they appear on the radio waves. This is the season for a final trip up the tower for a pre-winter inspection of the antennas, feed lines, waterproofing, and of the tower hardware too. Take the basic tower work tools, antenna work tools, and coax installing, securing, and waterproofing items too. Take your time and check every clamp, every coax connection on all sides. Jiggle everything with your hand to inspect for tightness. Be careful not to grab any active antennas while doing your annual inspection. It is not uncommon for things to vibrate loose during the year, and this may be your last chance to climb for months or more. So take care of it before winter's worst weather gets here. Sometimes that last climb of the year is during light rain or wind. I'll climb during some wind, but prefer not to. Sometimes I don't have a choice. If you're a once a year climber and have never gone up in a stout wind and are easily made seasick, you may want to reconsider climbing in the wind. On an unguide, self-supporting tower in the wind, the tower sways around, which causes you to feel dizzy and wobbly. When you're on the tower, above the tree line, there are no references around you to let you know that you're moving. And since the tower and you are both swaying at the same rate, while the tower may actually be swaying several inches, it looks like you're sitting perfectly still. This optical illusion can make your head spin or feel dizzy. If you're used to it, this is no problem. But if you're easily made nauseated and you're only holding onto the tower with your hands, it could cost you your life if you suddenly had to vomit while climbing. So if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness easily, you may want to avoid climbing during winds more than a gentle breeze. Just be patient and wait for better weather. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available to download as a podcast from anywhere on the web. Podcasts are available. And finally this week, amateur radio operators join the Indian Space Research Organization and the rest of the nation in marking the arrival of the Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft near the moon's south pole on August 23rd. With more on this story, we go to John Ross, KD8, IDJ. The special call sign AT2ISRO has been activated to commemorate India's Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft landing on the moon. Through August 25, 2023, four amateur radio operators in India will be making contacts. Activity will be on most of the HF, VHF, and UHF bands, as well as Echolink and FT8. The Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft was launched from southern India on July 14, 2023, and it shuts down on the moon August 23rd at 8.34 a.m. Eastern Time. And that landing makes India the fourth country after Russia, U.S., and China to land on the moon, and the first to land on one of the moon's poles. A special QSL card will also be issued for all confirmed contacts. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. According to Arunava Day, VU3XRY, who has one of the activators, this use of the ISRO call sign, like the moon landing, was a first for India. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like the CQ0 UTRZ repeater on 439.175 MHz in Sierra Aristal in Portugal, covering Porto to Lira. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, Please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and OFCOM, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you... A 73.